ubiquitous as a species, but incredibly diverse genetically. Today, we're going to be talking about E. coli, the first genus within our Enterobacteriales lectures. E. coli is a key representative of the order Enterobacteriales, a diverse group of organisms that includes many genera of importance to both human and veterinary medicine. All of these organisms are gram-negative, fermentative rods, and within the order Enterobacteriales, we have seven bacterial family, including 88 different genera. There's even a genus called Wiggledsworthia. Uh, it got its name from a parasitologist, um, and this organism is known to inhabit the tsetse fly. Within the order, we have organisms from biocontainment levels one, all the way up to Yersinia pestis, which is biocontainment level three. These organisms are commonly divided based on their ability to ferment lactose, and on blood agar, the colonies are typically gray, although they range from sort of small round colonies to large ones that will swarm the entire plate, covering all of the other bacterial growth. Here you can see our old friend E. coli growing on blood agar, these sort of flat, roughly round, uh, non-hemolytic colonies in this particular case, although he, some E. coli are hemolytic. And then on the right, we have E. coli growing on McConkey agar. Now, McConkey is selective for gram-negative enterics and differentiates bacteria based on their ability to ferment lactose. So as a lactose fermenter, E. coli grows as these bright pink colonies. Here we have a pure culture of Klebsiella pneumoniae, a closely related organism to E. coli. And what I think you can appreciate here is just how much more mucoid these colonies are than the E. coli we saw in the blood agar on the last slide. Generally speaking, Klebsiella pneumoniae tend to be more mucoid than E. coli, although this isn't always the case. Here we have Proteus mirabilis. This organism swarms plates. So you can see our first streak, second streak, and third streak here, but waves of bacteria have swarmed to cover the entire surface over just an overnight incubation. Um, this organism also has a distinctive smell, so whenever we open up our incubators, we always know if we have port proteus swarming. Here we have a gram stain of a pure culture of E. coli, and I think you can see these nice uh, gram negative or pink rods. Organisms within this family, and actually within the entire order, Enterobacteriales, are widely disseminated and ubiquitous. They're found in the environment, they're in the intestinal tract, they're in the respiratory tract. Um, some of them occupy very specialized ecological niches. So Salmonella typhi, for instance, um, is only known to colonize humans. We are the only reservoir. While others have a very generalist nature. So Pantoea literally means of all sorts and sources. Um, this is primarily a pet plant pathogen, but also causes diseases in vertebrates, including metritis in horses. In this lecture, I'm not going to go through all of the taxonomy of the order Enterobacteriales, but I do think it's important to be familiar with at least the most clinically relevant species. So here we have five of the bacterial families within the order and representative genera and species that are known to be of importance to both human and veterinary medicine. I would encourage all of you to familiarize yourself with these organisms and be able to recognize the names. Knowing that you're dealing with one of the Enterobacteriales can really help you in uh, selecting antimicrobial therapy empirically while waiting for uh, final culture and susceptibility test results. Differential media can be really useful when trying to isolate and identify different Enterobacteriales. On the left here, we have eosin methylene blue. Um, on this type of media, Lactose fermenting bacteria form these sort of metallic green liquid metal kind of colonies. And then on the right, we have XLT4, um, which differentiates those bacteria that are able to produce hydrogen sulfide. So these black colonies here are H2S producers, and that may be indicative of something like a Citrobacter, a Proteus, or even a Salmonella. Biochemically, these organisms are also readily differentiated. In photo number one, we have the indole test. The tube on the left is an uninoculated tube, and you can see it just has this straw yellow color to the media. On the right, we have E. coli, which is indole positive. In the center, we have the citrate test. Um, on the left, we have an uninoculated tube. In the center, we have an E. coli, which is citrate negative. 
And then on the right, we have a Klebsiella pneumoniae, which is citrate positive, resulting in this color change to blue. And finally, in picture three, we have the urease test. So an uninoculated tube on the left, E. coli in the center, and Klebsiella pneumoniae on the right. The tube motility test can also be very, very useful. Some enterobacteriales are motile, some are non-motile. Um, what we're looking for in this assay is whether we get bacteria spreading out from a stab uh, inoculation that we make into the semi-solid media. So here we have an uninoculated tube. There's no purple growth, which indicates bacteria. Here we have a non-motile organism. So we've stabbed in our bacteria, and you can see that it's not growing out from this initial stab point. And then in the center, we have a motile bacteria that's very clearly uh, swimming out into the media, giving us this fuzzy appearance. The TSI slant or triple sugar iron uh, tubes are also frequently used. Um, this media allows us to assay for a variety of different uh, physiological characteristics. So whether we get the production of acid or alkaline metabolic byproducts, whether we have hydrogen sulfide, and although not pictured here, we can also see organisms that produce gas. For the rest of today's lecture, we'll be focusing on the genus Escherichia. There's six species uh, of Escherichia, of which E. coli is probably the most famous. And within E. coli, we have an absolutely tremendous amount of diversity. There's more difference between any two given E. coli species than we have between, for instance, the genus Escherichia and another genus, Shigella. The diversity within E. coli, I think, is really nicely captured by this figure. So what you can see is that we have a total of approximately 3,000 E. coli strains, which were all sequenced. So whole genome sequencing was carried out. And what the investigators did is they counted up the number of genes that were identified from this entire population. Now, what you can see for E. coli is that um, the number of core genes, so those which are shared by all isolates within this collection is actually quite low. It's a relatively small proportion of all of the genetic material within this species. The accessory genome, so those genes which are in some strains but not all of them, um, continue to go up as we sequence more and more and more. This is a relationship that we don't see with many other bacterial species where eventually we reach a point where these curves sort of plateau off with the majority of the genes being in the core genome and a small number of accessory genes. So a huge amount of diversity that I think really speaks to the diverse clinical presentations we associate with E. coli. E. coli are commonly divided into pathotypes, which are defined based on the set of virulence factors that a particular isolate possesses, which allow it to cause a particular set of syndromes. Um, oftentimes, the clinical manifestations of an E. coli infection are species or age-specific. Some strains may be non-pathogenic. They may colonize certain hosts while causing very serious disease in others. Some of the specificity is due to the presence of receptors in certain host populations, but not others. We can very broadly divide our E. coli up into those which are diarrheogenic from those which are extra-intestinal pathogenic, or expex. Among our diarrheogenic E. coli, we're going to discuss a few key examples. First are our STEX, our shigatoxin-producing E. coli. These are associated with bloody diarrhea, systemic disease. In pigs, STEX cause a syndrome called edema disease. And among human pathogenic strains, we see them commonly carried by cattle and other ruminants. Enterotoxigenic E. coli cause watery diarrhea and it's associated with neonatal diarrhea in pigs, calves, and lambs. Enteropathogenic E. coli cause watery, watery diarrhea with characteristic attaching and effacing lesions. So the cells tightly bind to the uh, intestinal epithelium and denude the microvilli. Next, we have our extra-intestinal pathogenic E. coli. So those which are uropathogenic are UPEX, causing urinary tract infections and urosepsis in dogs and people, or sepsis-causing E. coli, which cause bacteremia and sepsis, and then avian pathogenic E. coli, which are particularly adapted to poultry and other birds. Very briefly, we're going to go through the types of virulence factors we find in each of these populations, starting with our STEX. So STX, 
Um, the Shiga toxins, of which we have multiple variants, are really the hallmark of Shiga toxin producing E. coli. They act by interfering with protein synthesis, causing edema and hemorrhage. These toxins may be phage mediated, and as a result of that, treatment with antimicrobials can be contraindicated. The fluoroquinolones and trimethoprim sulfa can actually increase toxin expression, paradoxically making the disease worse. Some Aztec E. coli also produce an intamin, um, the EAE gene, which is also associated with attaching and effacing lesions. Our enterotoxigenic E. coli is a cause of neonatal cholebacillosis in ruminants and pigs. Um, in people, we also see it as a cause of weanling diarrhea and traveler's diarrhea. This is a group of organisms that have really interesting um, host specificity. So we see both species specificity and age specificity based on the presence of receptors in the host. So our E. coli is expressing F4 fimbrae, these uh, sort of microbial grappling hooks that allow them to grab onto host receptors, are uniquely targeting uh, receptors found in piglets. And it's piglets only up to about eight weeks old. So we don't tend to see these causing infections in older animals. Similarly, those organisms expressing F5 fimbrae are uniquely adapted to causing disease in calves who are in the first few days of life. ETEX also produce toxins. The heat labile toxin, or LT, increases uh, cyclic AMP levels, which leads to increased fluid and electrolyte excretion. Um, it's actually quite similar to a toxin that's produced by Vibrio cholera, which we'll talk about in another lecture and the heat-stable toxin, which interferes with the enteric nervous system. EPEX um, histologically cause characteristic attaching and effacing lesions. So this is where we have bacteria closely adhered to enterocytes, so that epithelium within the, uh, the intestine, um, you see heavily colonized enterocytes, and maybe even intracellular bacteria. We get erosions of uh, the mucosal surface, and you can see denuding of the microvilli histologically. EAE, enterocyte attaching and effacing, um, is a key virulence factor. This encodes an intamin, which allows the bacteria to attach. And E. coli producing EAE are increasingly recognized in companion animals, potentially as a cause of uh, enteritis that mimics typical parvovirus presentation. Uropathogenic E. coli cause opportunistic uh, urinary tract infections in people and companion animals. And if we think about the environment that these bacteria are surviving in, the armament of virulence factors that they have makes a lot of sense. They produce fimbrae, which protect against phagocytosis. They have flagella, which allow them to cause these ascending infections. They can swim up from the urethra into the bladder, and then from the bladder up the ureters um, into the kidneys. They produce siderophores, specifically aerobactin, which facilitates the acquisition of iron in this very iron-poor uh, media, which is the urine. And they're frequently also hemolytic, producing alpha-hemolysin, which is a pore-forming toxin. Uropathogenic E. coli also sometimes have the ability to cause intracellular infections. So they're not simply in the lumen of the bladder, but they can get into the uroepithelium and sort of hide out from the immune system. This is an image from a paper in PLOS Medicine, which really nicely demonstrates how these bacteria are within the cells. In panel A, we have our bacteria labeled with a green fluorescent stain. So wherever you see green here, this is associated with E. coli. In panel B, we have a red fluorescent stain, which highlights uroepithelial cells. And then in the merged image C, you can see the presence of these organisms within the cell actually forming intracellular bacterial communities. E. coli strains responsible for sepsis can possess a wide range of virulence factors, including fimbrae for attachment, adherence, possibly avoiding phagocytosis, a capsule, again, to prevent phagocytosis, siderophores for iron scavenging. Um, again, we think about blood as being a really iron-rich environment, but it's actually all very tightly bound by host proteins. And so bacteria require these um, chelators in order to scavenge iron, which is present at a low concentration. Endotoxin, of course, this is a component of the gram-negative cell wall, that lipopolysaccharide, and colicin V, which imparts serum resistance, 
which we can think of as helping the bacteria to avoid the complement membrane attack complex, so part of the innate immune system. And finally, our avian pathogenic E. coli. These strains are also characterized by a constellation of virulence factors, including fimbrae, invasins, hemolysins, which are poor-forming toxins that not only act against erythrocytes, but white blood cells and can help to prevent phagocytosis, and of course, siderophores. We're going to start our discussion of specific syndromes with F4 E. coli, which causes piglet diarrhea. In the very young piglets, so those kind of zero to four days old, um, we can get very, very severe infections, leading to high mortality rates and extreme dehydration. These severe forms are more commonly seen in gilt litters, so the first litter of pigs that a sow has, and less commonly in higher parity animals. Young piglet diarrhea occurs sort of in that period from four days until weaning, and then we can also see post-weaning diarrhea. Treatment of these infections relies on antimicrobials, if at all possible based on antimicrobial susceptibility testing, and of course fluid therapy. Management is very, very important in intensive agricultural settings. Um, barns need to be kept clean. We need to reduce the buildup of pathogens in the environment, which serves as a risk factor for these infections in young piglets. These animals also need to be kept really, really warm. Piglets need to be between 30 and 34 degrees Celsius um, until they're weaned. So warm and dry are key protective measures that we can put in place. In these two images, you can see piglets affected with cholebacillosis. On the left-hand side, um, we have staining of the upper legs, the tail, and the perineum with feces, just demonstrating how profuse the diarrhea can be. And then on the right, we have some severely dehydrated piglets. You can see just how emaciated and sickly they are. Mm -hmm.